birds, right? Class, class Aves is nested within class Reptilia. And to recognize, oh, here we go, here we go. Crocodilians is misspelled. He's silently connecting my uh, grammar. Birds are monophyletic, and reptiles are not. So uh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> got it. Birds are monophyletic, reptiles are not. Okay, got it. <laughs> got to remember that, got to remember that. Okay, there's a paraphyletic group, and class Reptilia is paraphyletic with respect to birds, with respect to aves. Okay, moving on. I'm sure you'd love to see me in town go at it, toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe here, but um, I want to point out that phylogenies can come in a whole variety of shapes and sizes and orientations. And I want to look at these two. Do those look different to you? It's just the same thing that's been turned on its side, right? And you'll see these represented in publications in all different shapes and forms. How about this one? It's the same thing, right? If we just, again, start at the tips and work your way back. C and D are each other's closest relatives. They are linked to the taxon, the species E, right there. The next group is F, right there. They say the same thing. They just look different. Here's another one. You see sometimes that way. This one's a little different, right? No, it's the same thing, right? It's exactly the same. It says the same thing. So you want to know that all these things, you want to pay attention to the branching order. And again, starting at the tips, working your way back into the tree, you'll get arrived at the conclusion that those are definitely the same thing. Here's another one for you. How about this tree versus this tree? Hmm. Anyone have any ideas? The same thing. Right. All right. All right. Yep. That's the same thing, right? What have I done here? I just turned it over. Yeah. How about this one? This one's really different, though. Got to admit, with right, this is definitely not the same thing, right? Nope, that's the same thing too. So if you start at the tips and work your way back, you still come to the same conclusion. A and B are each other's closest relatives here. C and D are each other's closest relatives, and they're most closely related to E. So see how I've just swiveled the, the nodes on the tree? It's like one of those mobiles that you hang above your child's crib, um, the, one of those things that distracts a baby in the crib that has the, the, the mobile with the branches that move around and turn around. All of these, um, this phenomenon we refer to as swiveling nodes. And you want to know that the nodes on a, on a phylogenetic tree can swivel, and they, they mean the same thing. So just because C and F are now close to each other, oh god, here we go. Just because C and F are close to each other here doesn't change the fact that uh, C is actually cl most closely related to D. Just like here, C is most closely related to D. Um, we just swiveled the nodes and changed things around. But if you start at the tips and work your way back, you're always going to come to the same, same conclusion. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about characters on trees. And this is going to become important uh, when we talk about how phylogenies might be used to represent classification schemes. So um, the kind of characters that we want to refer to or make um, distinguish between are uh, ancestral characters versus derived characters. And of course, just like the, the, those words sound, ancestral is a character. Uh, an ancestral character is one that comes from deep in the evolutionary history of a group, and a derived character is one that's um, advanced with respect to that evolutionary origins, or has changed. Uh, we want to talk about characters that are shared by multiple species versus not shared. And that should be pretty straightforward. Birds all have wings and feathers. Those are shared characters of birds. Okay. Um, actually, you could make the argument that wings might not be shared by, by birds, right? Because they're also present in bats, right? Those might not be shared, depending on how you define what a wing is. Turns out it's different because the wings on bats are their hand bones, but the wings on birds are their whole arm. Okay, keep going. Shared, um, okay, so now we have these two things. Shared, ancestral versus derived, shared versus non-shared, and we put those two together we talk about shared derived characters, which is something we call a synapomorphy. It's a character that is a shared character between multiple species, and it's derived in the tree. It's evolutionary advanced or evolutionary change since with respect to an ancestor. We have things that are shared ancestral characters, which are characters that you might see in multiple taxa, but they come from so deep in the evolutionary tree that all the other things in that genus have them as well. So. Um, 
with respect to the clade that represents birds, um, feathers might be viewed as a shared ancestral character because all birds, in modern aves anyway, all have feathers, I think. Is that right? Okay, they're not paying attention. Okay, and then finally, the other obvious, pers the obvious um, other kind of character would be things that are uniquely derived characters, characters that are only seen in one species, and those are referred to as autapomorphies. So you have about five or six definitions to remember, and that's about as far as I want to go with, uh, with the technical terms. What I'd like to do now is just um, test your knowledge of, the, of those different types of character states. So I've come up with the phylogeny here, and I've mapped some characters onto the species. So these are the tips of the trees, and in these species, X is a character that all these species share. And in these species over here, O is a, is a character that those three species share. And in this one taxon over here, it has the character Z. So just think of these as morphological characters, like this character over here has a, has a red bill, and these, these characters over here all have um, a big, long, feathered tail, and these taxa all the way across the tree all have feathers. That's what I mean by the level at which we share or don't share character states. Okay, so O in this case, so he, it's, it's a character that's shared by these three taxa. O is, it was what I mean by a synapomorphy. It's a shared, derived character. It was absent in, down here in these ancestors, and so O is not seen in these species here. But it's only at this point in the tree where the evolution of O, in our case, what did I say, big long feathered tail, um, evolved, and O is a synapomorphy for these three species. It's a shared, derived character, meaning O has evolved, the big long tail has evolved from an ancestor that didn't have it. So, a shared, derived character. The presence of feathers in this group of birds is what we refer to as a symplesiomorphy. It's a shared, ancestral character. It's an ancestral character, it's the state that all the taxa in this clade have, which means that they got it from their ancestor, so it's an ancestral character. It's shared across all the taxa, but it's, from, it's ancestral. It's, it's shared by everything, and we know then that it evolved down here in the evolutionary distant history of this group. And then the other character state, that we, the other kind of character we talked about is autapomorphy, which is, again, that Z that only appears in this one taxon, that's a uniquely derived character. It's derived, it's something that has been an evolutionary advancement, but it is share, it's not shared, it's unique, and it's only present one taxon. Okay, so I wanted to put these, that stuff that we just went over there into this uh, presentation for you and go through that, those explanations so that when we go talk about phylogenies and how they can be used for recognizing um, um, higher, higher diversity and structuring higher diversity and a novel type of uh, classification code, the phylo code, um, we all have the fundamentals of how phylogenies look and how we use them. Okay, note that, um, I should go back here, that uh, what if you had a clay like this that where all the species here, in our case, had feathers? And what if you discovered a bird from, um, I'm just gonna make something up, uh, from, a, from an island somewhere out in the Pacific that didn't have any feathers? Are there modern birds that don't have feathers? No. So what if you found a species that, that lacked that character? Now we've inferred that the evolution of feathers or whatever it was evolved here, and so this species should have it, but somewhere along the evolutionary history of this group, it lost it. And we all know of cases of species that lose characters, right? Cave fish lose their eyes, and other groups of cave organisms lose their pigment because they're in the dark the whole time. We know of cases of, cases where, or cases of groups of organisms that have evolutionarily lost characters through their time. And an evolutionary loss of a character, in this case a, a featherless bird from an island in the Pacific, um, is what we refer to as an evolutionary, as a reversal of a character state. And so you can imagine a case where the character state evolved here, it's present in all the taxa except for this one, which would mean that we would infer on, that it reversed on this part in the tree, or you could also represent it like this, where it may have reversed here, and then secondarily re-evolved here. And we might think of that X, I call it X prime, because it's the re-evolution of the same character. We could think of that as an odd apomorphy, as a uniquely derived character in that case, because it's not shared in the same way with everything else in the tree. So those are how things can get kind of confusing. So let's go back to something we all know a lot about. Um, let's go through some characters here. I want you to tell me whether they are synapomorphy, symplesiomorphy, or odd apomorphy for a clade that is familiar to all of us 
And these are the inferred divergence times between these taxa. And we have a chimp, like the ones that we might get lucky and see in Rumpy Hills, and Wonder Woman, who I don't think we'll see in Rumpy Hills unless we're really lucky. So, Corp. Oh, oh, sorry, Corp. Corp is where, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so let's go through some characters. Large brain size. So that's a character state. Large brain size is one that is shared by all great apes. What kind of character is that? I hear some sins. Synapomorphy. Synapomorphy, right? It's something that the large, the great apes share. Chimps, is that right? Chimps, bonobos, humans, um, gorillas, orangutans. So that would be something that evolved right here. It's a shared, derived character, and all the great apes had it. I think I got that right. If I didn't, my wife, who's a primatologist, will kill me later. Five digits. Again, shared by all great apes. Another synapomorphy probably evolved right in the same place. Um, or actually, they probably evolved earlier, and then there's some things in between that have lost a digit. Uh, how about reduction of body hair? What kind of character is that? I think I heard it here. Autapomorphy, right. It's only present in Wonder Woman, I mean in humans, right? Reduction of body hair. Or it may, it may be present in things that have, that were, that uh, earlier things that have now gone extinct. But for now, among the extant taxa, reduction of body hair could be viewed as an autapomorphy. How about um, suspension um, mobile shoulder joints that allow you to go like this for brachiating? groups of things. I think that's something, I may be wrong about this, I think that is something that is present in um, humans, I'm not sure about chimps and, chimps and bonobos, but definitely in gibbons, right, brachiators. So that will be something that um, pops up in a couple different places, and it may be, it may be a synapomorph, it may be a symplesiomorphy, it may be something that evolved earlier and then was lost in a couple taxa, or it could be a a, an autapomorphy in Gibbons and a synapomorphy in this other group over here. So you can see how when we make these references to symplesiomorphy or autapomorphy or polyphyly versus paraphyly, it's all with, with, um, with reference to at what level in the tree we're talking about. Um, tool use. I think I got this right. Tool use would be pre what, what uses tools? Humans use tools. Chimps are famous for using tools. Bonobos, they use tools, right? So tool use probably evolved right in here on this little short inner node right here in among the great apes. So it's not something that's, I think I got this right, that's not shared by all great apes, but it's a synapomorph for humans, chimps, and bonobos. I may be wrong about that, but I'm just, you know, we're going through this exercise to, to show you the, um, the idea, the principles. Fission fusion social systems. This is where a group of organisms could be part of a larger group and exchanging genes with a meta population, but they tend to group into small groups for the purpose of hunting and uh, making it through uh, different parts of the seasons of the year. And then they, those, those groups of different, like troops of, of organisms come together and sometimes individuals will switch back and forth and then they, they fuse and they fission and go off separately, but there's sometimes exchange between the social groups. Anyone have any idea? I think that fission fusion social systems are in chimps and bonobos and humans and um, spider monkeys, which are somewhere out here in the, in the distant evolutionary past of this group. So that would be um, a um, symplesiomorphy that may have reversed in the groups in between, or it could be a synapomorphy for this whole clade and then a reverse number of times. I hope you get the point. Okay, so here's the final test of these basic principles. Uh, what kind of character is X? Just shout it out. Oh, no. Apomorphy, exactly, because it's uh, uniquely derived in one species and not shared with anything else. How about this one, O? Synapomorphy, right? Because it's shared and it's derived. There you go. How about this one? Synapomorphy, exactly. Again, it's shared by these four taxa and derived with reference to the base of the tree. How about this one? Symplesiomorphy. Everyone got that one? How about that one? Synapomorphy, again, unique, shared, and derived. How about this one? Synapomorphy. That one? All right, you guys are experts in this. Okay, let's move on. Okay. So, um, 
Remember, I guess one of the points that, uh, before I go into um, how we can use trees to talk about classification, I want to make the point that um, speciation is best thought of as a process. It's something that happens through time um, and as a result of different things. And it's not, it's not um, sometimes people think of speciation as an event, and that's probably an improper way to think about it. We should think of speciation as a, as a, as a process that happens through time. And so here's different ways of, of representing um, allopatric, well, in this case, allopatric speciation. So imagine a population that um, of these brown snails that don't have any funny, fancy stripes on their shells that was widely distributed across the Congo Basin. And eventually one of those rivers that cuts across the Congo Basin shifted and divided the geographical range of this population of snails. They used to occur in this amount of space, and a river moved and, and cut them in, into two different geographical distributions. And now there's snails on one side of the river and snails on the other, and, with, and they're isolated from each other. And they can't, there's no dispersal across the river because snails can't swim across strong currents. And eventually, this population starts to accumulate differences. And this one is uh, brown, and this one's brown and striped. And eventually that river dries up, or shifts again, and these taxa come in back, back in contact with each other, and now they look different and they don't recognize each other. And so that might be one way of representing speciation. A barrier forms, and the species evolve in isolation, and then if they come back together, now they're new species, and they, they, don't, uh, they don't recognize each other. They don't interbreed because they don't recognize them, each other as their own species, and they have become new species. But that happened through time. It's an allopatric speciation event. Um, species are not instantaneously produced. It takes time. So here's an evolutionary tree that we've turned from this upside down. And so this is the past at the top, and these are present day lineages. And here is the best sort of a, a good way to think about divergence in population, which is these different lineages um, uh, that begin diverging at some point, and that point is right here in the tree when those lineages start to diverge. But it's not until we get down to here that that speciation is really complete. And this process of, of divergence in between is something that takes time. And eventually, these things are completely separated, as represented by the fork and the branch here, just like the situation in the tree over here. And speciation is complete, but the process of divergence began all the way back here, at some point deeper in the evolutionary time of that group. So those are two ways of representing it. Here's another way. So here's the tree turned right side up again. And here it is here. And the point I want to make with respect to this tree is that it takes time for reproductive isolation to occur, um, and each of those species to accumulate differences that we recognize or they recognize that contribute to the process of them diverging and no longer exchanging genetic information and becoming separate lineages or separate species. And um, I won't go into too much detail about the philosophy, but people may recognize different things, right? Here's the beginning of divergence, and we're going this way is recent, up at the tips of the tree, and here's back in time. Divergence started here, and as we go up, you can see that the divergence is starting, and these things are becoming slightly different populations with time, and eventually they are completely cut off from each other, and one is going this way along a lineage, and one's going this way, and there's no longer any exchange of material between them or interbreeding between them um, or, or other, other forms of contact between them. And at one point, one taxonomist might recognize this spot, Another taxonomist might be focused on ecology, and that person might focus this point at this level in the tree. This ecologist, this taxonomist might be focused on morphology, and maybe that taxonomist is going to recognize these things as separate species. This taxonomist might be representing more, uh, molecular data, and so maybe that taxonomist is only going to recognize this level of divergence in the tree. You know, all of these things on the side are artificial with respect to the actual process. The different species concepts are all just taxonomists focusing on different kinds of characters. Um, and we may be focusing on different recognition criteria, any of these different points in the tree, but we want to keep in mind, in the back of our mind, that the process of divergence starts here and ends here, and that we are just trying to detect it by whatever means we can, whatever means we can find. Um, and um, really, the evolutionary process is, is um, agnostic with respect to the way in which we perceive it.